Continuing with our gospel reading for this morning, that's Matthew 20, verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner saying, these last worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Are you interested in praying for the preacher this morning? Anybody who can walk? I guess we'll just go on then. I'll go, I'll go. Thank you, John. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Pastor Terry. And please bless her here this morning as she preaches your word and help the the words that she preaches make a difference in our lives as we go on uh, this week and and onward. And uh, we also pray for her health to to get better uh, so that she can be even stronger in her ministry here at Epworth Church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, John. Tempted and tried, we're oft made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long while there are others living about us never molested though in the wrong. Farther along we'll know all about it Farther along we'll understand why. Cheer up, my brother, live in the sunlight. We'll understand it all by and by. Raise your hand if you knew that one. It's Frida again. Frida, oh, we got Carolyn back there. I will never do that song in the bulletin because that really stinks. A lousy song, isn't it? Might as well be amazing grace that saved a rich like me. The rest of you are on your own. One of these days you're going to get yours, and I'm going to watch it, and I'm going to laugh. That's really what the song is saying, isn't it? One of these days you're going to get yours, and I'm going to get to sit and watch it happen. Not a great song, is it? But it goes with Jonah. And thank you, John. You're a very good Jonah. You have a fit like nobody ever saw. And um, Jonah, the story pretty much is the same today, isn't it? I don't know where they do it in Baltimore County, but I've heard that there's a place in Baltimore City, I know in Martinsburg, West Virginia, it was at the 7-Eleven at the corner of King and Queen Street, and also in Frederick, Maryland at the Home Depot, that every time you go in the morning, there's a group of people there waiting to work. They're probably undocumented, they're mostly undocumented workers, and they're lined up. Somebody will come along in a truck and say, you, 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 get in the car, we're gonna go. They can pay them very little and they can get a full day's work out of them. Now. If you were going to do that, who would you pick out of that crowd of people? I want to really answer. I'm not, this is not a 
one of those rhetorical questions. If you're going to pick somebody to work for you during the day, who would you look for in this crowd of men standing there working or looking for work? Would you pick the older guys, the ones who are my age, maybe with a rollator like mine, bent over? No, you'd pick the young, strong guys, right? That's what it would happen here because it didn't say, you know, when they said, when the vineyard owner saw them standing idle, he said, why didn't you, why are you standing there idle? And they said, nobody picked us. No one has hired us. Same thing that happened there, right? But what happens at the end of the day when they're all paid? This is where we all get a little stung by this one, isn't it? Because what happens when the workers who have been there all day look at these guys who came and worked an hour, two hours, what do they say? Not fair, it's not fair, it's not fair, just like Jonah, it's not fair. You say you're going to kill those Ninevites. Uh, I want to die, I'm so mad. That's pretty mad, isn't it? Because somebody didn't get zapped. Now let's look at the story of Jonah. Everybody thinks it's a kid's story because there's a big fish in it. It's not about kids at all. Jonah is sent to Nineveh by God. Nineveh is not a Jewish city by any stretch of the imagination. They're living dissolute lives. They're, they're a mess. He says they don't even know their right hand from their left. I did not do a thing, Steve. You didn't do it either, huh? Wow. Everybody awake now, huh? Okay. Are we all right, ready to go again? Can you all hear me? Nope. I gotta get back on my track. My train derailed up here. You can hear me now? Okay, I don't have to start over there, do I? You all heard everything up till the thunk, 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 thunk. All right, I gotta think where I was. So, what happens when you preach without the paper in front of you? You gotta remember where you are in the paper. And the paper is gone and the thought trail the rain. Train derailed. Nineveh, Nineveh, that's right. Nineveh, they were a mess in Nineveh, a hot mess. The whole place is crazy. They didn't know their right hand from their left, meaning these are people who do not know God. They're living in sin. They're just making a mess of things. And God was so angry, he said, just go wipe the whole city out. Tell them I'm going to kill them all. Jonah's happy to do that. Nope, he doesn't want to go to Nineveh. These are rotten, lousy people. Why should he waste his time there? So he gets on a ship, heads in the other direction. What happens to the ship? There's a storm at sea, and he, in his one noble moment, Jonah says, I know what's wrong, it's me. And they throw him overboard, and he thinks it's the end of him, but the fish swallows him up, spits him out on the shore of Nineveh, and grudgingly, grudgingly, begrudgingly, he goes in and says, all right, God's going to get you. Then he thinks he's going to get the great pleasure of watching these people die. He goes up the hill, sits there, because he's got a front row seat, he's got the popcorn, he's waiting for these people to just get mowed down by God. But what happens? It never happens when a pastor preaches. They repent of their sin. They listen to the preacher. My golly. Should be a great moment. Jonah should say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. They listen to me. But he says, what do you mean you're not going to kill him, Lord? I want to die. I'm so mad at you, God. I want to die. God says, what? What? And Jonah's, we read the end of the story today, doesn't he? sits there and he's mad and he wants to die. He's so angry. God gives him a little bush that grows up so he has some shade. And then God kills the bush. I love this story. If I were God, I would just fry Jonah, which is a good thing I'm not God. I would just said, zap. There you go, boy. You're so happy everybody else is dying. But I told the kids up here, didn't I, that I have a problem. Sometimes I'll say to people, Jesus is going to ask you for an explanation one day. Get it ready now. That's not a good thing to do, but I have done that. I have said that to people, usually on the phone who are trying to cheat somebody out of something else. They'll say, get your answer ready because Jesus is going to ask you about it one day, which is my way of judging them, which is not a good thing either. So we have that story with the story of the vineyards, the vineyard owner and the, the 
people working for him, the ones who worked all day in the hot sun laboring, picking those grapes and cutting the vines and doing all those things. And they think when they see these guys getting paid so much for an hour of work, they think, ooh, we're going to get something real good, aren't we? We're going to get five times what they get, and they get the same amount. And what do they say? It's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair. Anybody here ever do a group project in school? You did all the work, and somebody else got the same grade you did who did nothing, and you go, it's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair. We know that feeling, don't we? I know that feeling. I had a dollar for every time somebody said to me, Pastor, do you mean to tell me that if somebody confesses on their deathbed, they've lived a rotten life, and they come to the end of their life, and they say, Jesus, I'm so sorry. Will you take me home with you? They get to go to heaven, and I'll say, according to Scripture, yeah. And they'll say, that's not fair. It's not fair. I'm like, wow. And then I'll ask them, what did you get cheated out of by knowing Christ your whole life? Adultery? Robbing a liquor store, shooting somebody in the head. Is that what you got cheated out of by not leading a life that was not in God the whole time? If I had a dollar for every time I was asked that question, I'd have a lot of dollars. I could pay everybody's apportionments off. Probably your mortgages as well, because people are so upset over that. It's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair. How many of you think it's not fair? You're not going to raise your hand now, are you? Because it's going to convict you. Well, we're called to rejoice when somebody comes to Christ. There's a story the old rabbis tell. I'm talking about in the days of Jesus and after Jesus. Talking to ancient rabbis would say that God rejoices over the repentance of one sinner. One sinner God rejoices, and we have scriptural evidence of that. But they'll say God was standing there talking to some of the people, and the people were saying, we got to see that one die. It's a good thing. And God said, don't think I rejoice over anyone who perishes without knowing me. Pretty, pretty stark words. It's not scriptural, but it is. I mean, that's the message of scripture, isn't it? That God wants us to repent and be part of the family. My husband was a Southern Baptist boy. He was a good Southern Baptist boy. Actually, he was more of a Methodist theologically, but his daddy was a Southern Baptist. He was going to be a Southern Baptist all his life. His pastor's name is Danny Gano, and I think Danny retired a couple years ago. Danny refers to himself as he used to be a falling down drunk. He didn't say he was an alcoholic. He said he used to be a falling down drunk until I knew Christ. He never, never hesitates to tell people where he was before he came to Christ. In fact, he knew my husband before my husband was in church and before Danny was a pastor. And once when Danny was drunk, he sold Richard his guitar for $30, a beautiful guitar worth a lot of money because he wanted to go buy beer. And he sold it to him for next to nothing. But Danny says, now heaven is an interesting place, he says. There's going to be doors into heaven, and one door is going to say Southern Baptist Center here, and they're going to say, look at us, we get to go in first. Next, that's the American Baptist, and Southern Baptists are going to look at them and say they're going someplace else. And they're going to look at the Methodists and say, well, we know where they're going. They're going down to the basement, this place. Catholics, they're not even going to get in probably because their door is so far around the back, nobody can even see where it says Roman Catholic. He said, and then they're all going to go in and realize they're all in the same place. They're going to look at each other and say, wow, what are you doing here? I think we're like that, aren't we? Picture the person that you think may not be there when you get there. Or picture the person that you will not get into heaven with because you don't want to be there with that person because there are people who... Like Jonah said, I'd rather be dead than be in heaven with you. There are people who say things like that. We're called to rejoice when anyone goes to heaven, aren't we? When anybody is, is with us in the faith, we're called to rejoice at them. Even if they treated us wrongly, we're not supposed to say, well, dag on it, you're going to get in too. That's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair. We're supposed to say, yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your grace shown to this one who once was lost and now is found. Like I say, amazing grace, how sweet the sound of the like me. The rest of you are on your own. But me, I'm saved. No, we're called to rejoice when anybody goes to Christ. Which brings us to this day. This is not the lesson for today. Lambert and I sit and we read the lessons together every week. And this was last week's lectionary, but we thought as Matthew gets closer and closer to the the time when Christ is going to suffer and die, which is when we get to Advent. It's really strange, isn't it, that we get to the end of the Gospels and we look at 
when Christ is about to be born, we look at the stories of Christ facing his own death. And this was an important story in Matthew's Gospel, so we came back and did this one. This would have been last week's lectionary, but we had a guest preacher last week. Because this is an important story to hear, isn't it, about what it means to come to Christ and what it is to judge others. Because we're not called to judge, we're called to rejoice when somebody accepts Christ. Which ended up being a good lesson for today, because this is World Communion Sunday. The day when we think about everybody in the world sharing communion. The Roman Catholic Church has communion every Sunday. The Disciples of Christ have communion every Sunday. There are other denominations that do communion more regularly. The Episcopal Church has communion every Sunday. There are those of us who generally celebrate once a month on the first Sunday of the month. The first Sunday of October has historically been World Communion Sunday. Yesterday was World Communion at the church because the people who were here yesterday, I counted probably between four and 500 people who came on this campus yesterday. People of all different colors, all different backgrounds, all different languages. For people, and Mark is here this morning, I'm glad Mark's here, because we want Mark to be on SPRC this year. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Mark is fluent in Spanish. We had people here yesterday who could not speak any English because they only spoke Spanish. Their children interpreted for them. We had people here from all over the world. We had people from all over Asia here. We had people here from Africa. We had people here from Essex. Wow, that's pretty far, isn't it, to come? Essex. They came all the way up here because they saw it. I had families come to me and say, thank you so much for doing this because I couldn't afford to take my kids any place. I couldn't afford to take my kids to the state fair, but I could bring them here and they could have games and play and have a good time. That's what people said. They said, thank you. And one man came up and said, where can I make a donation? I said, it's not necessary. He said, this had to cost you a lot. I said, oh, we're going to lose money today. We lost money yesterday. But we knew we were going to lose money coming into it because what we wanted to do was provide something for people, not expect them to pay for it all. And this man said, I want to make a $100 donation to your congregation right now. He said, if you want to do that, that's fine, but you don't have to do that. People are hungry for fellowship. They're hungry for community. They're hungry to belong. But we've got to make them feel welcome no matter where they're from, no matter what their background, no matter what their sin. Because we're all sinners in need of grace. Amen? Oh, please say it like you mean it. You're a sinner in need of grace just like me, right? Amen. We're called to have a different view. We're called not to be like Jonah and say, I'm so mad I could just die. If you're that mad, get over it. That's all you can do. Give it to Jesus and get over it. Move on. I said this in my first Sunday sermon here. Sometimes you just got to be like a Disney princess and let it go. Because we've got to love everybody that is out there in the world, no matter what they've done, no matter who they are, no matter what you know about them. And if they come to Christ, it's not up to you to judge them and say, no, we don't want you in here with these nice, fine-looking people in this congregation. We want everybody here. I used to serve First Church in Hyattsville, Maryland, which was the most diverse church in the annual conference. We had members from 14 nations and worshipers from 37 different nations who were there. Every time we took communion, people would wear their native outfits, and it would look like Pentecost to me, and I loved it. Now, we all didn't get along. The conference would run first church up the flagpole and say, look at this, we have this beautifully inclusive congregation. Now, they didn't all like each other. but They got along pretty well. I worked with the Reverend Dr. Lewis Shockley, who was a Ph.D. behavioral psychologist and a pastor in the United Methodist Church. He was offered the... Um, presidency of a major university while I was there and turned it down to stay at First Church Hyattsville. But he was their first African-American pastor and people did not like that at all there. Now Lou was a great preacher, probably the best preacher I'll ever hear in my life. He changed his preaching style to preach to a predominantly white congregation, which it still was with all those folks in there. He changed his preaching style because Lou could get riled up preaching, but he preached very very, very calm sermons. He would preach a different service, sermon at both services, and I'd say to him, how do you do that every week? He said, I just take one of my old sermons and cut it in half. I don't preach an hour here because white people don't like an hour-long sermon. I hear an amen on that one. And he would visit everybody who was sick in the hospital. He'd hold their hands. He would love them. And then when they died, they'd say, do not let that black man preach my funeral. 
That's what they would say again and again and again. It broke my heart. Cliff was one of the kindest people I've ever known. He and I loved to cook. We both were, were loving cooking together, and we'd cook together often. Thanksgiving was coming. He said, how many people are you cooking for this year? I said, only 14, because he had like 40 or 50 people coming to his home for his meal. And I said, I have a confession to make, Lou. I'm not making my own pie crust this year. And he said, oh, say it ain't so, girl. Say it ain't so. I said, I can't do it, Lou. I got too much going on. And I said, I'm going to use Pillsbury already pie crust. And he said, oh, no, no, no. The day before Thanksgiving, 6 o'clock in the morning, there was a knock on my door. And I opened the door. And the Reverend Dr. Lewis Shockley, who was offered the presidency of a major university in the United States, was standing there with six handmade pie crusts for me. Because he said, I couldn't sleep last night thinking about you and your tired old store-bought pie crust. I had to make you some. That's who he was. He was the most loving, giving man I've ever known in my life, and people did not want him preaching their funerals because he was black. It's the only reason. So we got some work to do in the world, don't we? We got some work to do in this congregation to make it more accessible to people. If we had the people who were at our festival yesterday here, it would be a different looking congregation. It would be one that looks like the kingdom of God with people of all different colors and ages and ethnicities. There were so many little toddlers here yesterday, I could not count them all running amok around here. We got kids in this community growing up without knowing the love of God and Jesus Christ because they are not in a church. We got to get them in here, folks, because that's who we are. We're called to take Christ into the streets so that Christ might live in the streets of Cockeysville so that we might bring people to Jesus Christ. Not saying to them, I'm in and you're out, but saying to them, we want you in here with us because that is who we are in Jesus Christ. Miss Toby, are you awake up there, girl? Yeah. I hear you painted faces till 5 p.m., an hour after the event ended. Because little kids wanted to have their faces painted. And Frida said to me, she said, we're going to have Kitty pulls full of corn so kids can go in with their construction things. I thought she was nuts. I said, corn? It was the hit of the day. People just love being here. They love being here. And people thanked me. There was a little lady who came up to me and said, I pray for you every Sunday. I said, you do? She said, I pray for you every day, actually. She said, I've worshipped you online every Sunday for months now, years now. Two or three people came and said, I recognize you, and I pray for you all the time. There are people in the world who need us. There are people in the world who need Christ, and they want to see Christ in us. So we can either do a Jonah and say, it's not fair, I want to die rather than be here with you, or we can go into the world with the message of Christ and say, in the name of Jesus Christ, you're part of us. We want you here with us. Please be with us. Amen, amen, amen. Let's join together in singing. <laughs> 